This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 242 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Fergus, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. So, hi, Reese. Hi, Philip. We are on our own today. Fingers well, crossed. a little bit. We've got a lot yeah. to do today. Um, <laughs> we do. It's we a busy are. Evening for us. Yeah, we are pre recording this episode, mm. this 242 for you today. And why is that, Reese? So I am actually off to South Africa um, on Saturday, and this is early January, so about the time that this airs, I will be on my way back. Um, So I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm doing. I uh, It actually has not much to do with dressage or horses. Um, A couple, about a year and a half ago, actually our local horse council uh, recommended me for a program called the Kentucky Ag Leadership Program. And it's a little bit what I did in school. I was an undergrad. I I did agriculture. I was an ag econ major. And then my master's is in international commerce. And running my farm and doing my training business, I wasn't really doing very much with my degree. Um, And this program kind of came up. And I thought, you know, that sounds kind of cool. I'll apply. And about 100 people applied. And there are 22 in the program. And I got in. So I've known about this trip actually for a while. Um, And it's sort of the capstone of our program. And this program is basically designed. It's it's a there's a class every two years and it's uh, ag leaders, young ag leaders from throughout the state of Kentucky. And we get together and we travel literally through the state looking at all kinds of operations. So. Um, I've been to Eastern Kentucky and looked at coal mining to, um, a tomato plant that produces all the tomatoes that kind of supply a lot of Tennessee and Kentucky, um, to Western Kentucky. We've seen big grain farms and, um, we've been to the university. We did some media training. Uh, so it's just a really wide variety of things that people would use in the ag sector. Um, so it's been great. And so our class as a group decided for our, our two week international trip that we would head to South Africa. So, uh, we're recording Philip, you didn't want to do it without me. So that's very flattering. <laughs> oh, there's so much you do for organizing the shows and everything. Reese. I, <laughs> and I would so just cute. miss you so much. We couldn't replace yeah. you. So, uh, you're so cute. Well, Philip <laughs> had to do all the organizing for this. So we'll see everybody how it goes. How it goes. Yeah, yeah, he did it <laughs> on our He's big day. Yeah. We're doing a bunch of, uh, a yeah. bunch of interviews and things. So, yep. uh, yeah, so it, it should be kind of a, really a trip of the lifetime. It's, it's a paid for trip uh, by the program, which is amazing that I get to go halfway around the world for two weeks and really not, I wouldn't have to necessarily pay for anything. Um, so meals and everything are paid for. Um, and we're going to go to Kruger National Park. We're actually going to go to an orphanage. Uh, we're going to see uh, a protea, a botanical garden. Uh, so we're just going to see all kinds of things. And, Sounds and, awesome. Yeah, it's going to be Lucky. awesome. And I know. I'm super excited. So it's been a challenge, you know, to to figure out what 16 – actually, no, I have 18 horses that I manage, what everyone's doing while I'm gone. And in theory, my assistant cannot get a hold of me. I, I you know, have no idea what my um, internet connection will be or if they'll have phones, but, I mean, they can reach me if they need to. So she's going to have a really big, big one. So shout out to Alexis because um, she's running the show. So, <laughs> yeah, we've uh, – you know, some horses are going to do some – I have a couple that are going to work with the amount of police and do some desensitization training my baby especially um i have one that went to kesmark which is um it's kind of a physical therapy place where he's gonna go and aqua tread and get on the walker and and get stronger there alexis has some horses to ride some are gonna have some time off so it's been it's been a challenge and, and i'm looking forward to actually getting on the plane um, yeah. so it's, it's a really good thing. So I will have lots to tell everybody when I get back and I'll That'll be really be refreshed. Yeah. So Philip and I, you both, uh, both of us going to Africa this, this season. Yeah, so isn't that fun. strange? Huh? I know. Very fun. So, so Philip, I, I learned a lot from your trip and, and I can't wait to share mine. So 
that's what I'm up to in the next two weeks. But like I said, I'll be actually on my way home when this episode airs. So um, I'll have lots to tell you when I get back for sure. Yeah, and gearing up for more more great radio stuff when you come back. I I'm gonna, know. We've I'm going to line up all kinds of amazing things. <laughs> I know. I love it, Phyllis. <laughs> you leave me in charge for a little while and I'll try not to mess it up. That's basically I it. I love it. Well, we've got <laughs> lots of great stuff with the Global Dressage Forum North America. We're going to be really gearing up for that. That's in February. And um, actually, I already booked my plane ticket. Get Philip. I booked it last night. Yeah. Um, so so now I can, am once Reese is organized, that that's my go ahead <laughs> to get going and yeah. uh, and do that. So. Yeah, so I hope everyone's, um, you know, staying warm and, you know, doing some stuff, you know, either are thinking about coming to the Global Dressage Forum. Um, I saw that Kira Kirkland's doing a, a, a class in Wellington that's going on. Um, but if you're not as lucky to, to be able to come to Wellington, you know, definitely check out a lot of the online sites, dressageclinic.com. Um, a USDF has a site where you can spend some time and do some fun continuing ed um, cuz i don't know about you philip but it is literally snowing sideways and it is freezing <laughs> outside today i want to talk about the day that that i had today i am Oh yeah, we had the same it was so cold the horses were crazy oh, it today it can't be as cold as it is here well it's going to be like it, it is going to be very cold it's going to be 9 degrees tomorrow here that's pretty cold um, for kentucky today today i think it was you know with the wind chill and everything oh. somewhere around minus 30 woman <laughs> um, but I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit. So it's cold. It it doesn't matter. It's very cold. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure matter. by the time we finish recording, our fingers and toes will be unnumb. Oh, okay, I got it. I just looked it up online. The uh, uh, with the wind chill, it's minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Are you kidding me? No, Do you I'm go outside? Oh my god! I was outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Needless, Needless to say, there wasn't a whole lot of riding going on today. No, no, you can't ride it. Just kind of turn out and, no and stuff like that. But yeah, we're supposed to have this kind of thing for a couple of days, and then it'll warm back up. So, oh. um, you know, contrary oh. to popular belief, it doesn't stay that that cold for long where I am, anyway. So that's good. Kinda well, Philip, how, how was your New Year's? I didn't even ask you. Oh yeah, it is Happy New Year Day. Happy it's, New Year, everybody! <laughs> it's January third. It is. Happy New Year, everyone. Well, it was good. We just went yeah. to our friend's house and, uh, you know, a few of our friends got together and we just had a good, you know, kind of a little get together party. It wasn't anything crazy and uh, it was good. It was good. good. And oh, yours? Were you even awake? Oh, you, that's really funny, Philip. Very funny, huh? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were awake and we actually went to a really nice dinner downtown with some friends. And it's actually my best friend's birthday, New Year's Eve. So we celebrated her birthday. And then we had another group of friends that had a party. So um, we were we were big time in it. We really were. We were okay. we had a really good time. No, it was um, both, both poor Travis and I both had been sick over the holidays. So oh. We didn't like party like rock stars, but we definitely were up past midnight um, and all dressed up. And it was very fun. It was fun to get together with everybody. So awesome. and, and I had a surprise birthday party over the weekend. Oh, Reese. I might. I have not. Had a birthday. It's not your birthday. Well, I guess it, is, it uh, will have well, been when this be. when this episode i will have had my birthday but yep. my mom and my family my husband and um they they totally bamboozled me and of course i wasn't thinking at all about my birthday yep. and they got me great it was awesome all the girls from the barn and and, and it was quite the party it was oh. wonderful no wonder so, yeah, you were I, sick you and travis were sick you were just... i know we had you were partying like rock stars. Oh, yeah. So I, I, yes. And normally I don't get a birthday because, you know, we're traveling to Florida or whatever. And we usually celebrate, but I'm typically not with my family on my birthday ever. So, so that was pretty fun. So yeah, we've actually been very social. So that's been pretty fun. It is the season, isn't it? Yeah, I know. I'm ready. To, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm ready to sort of get back in routine, back to working out, back to we've been riding. But, you know, it's, it is hard to be consistent when Christmas is on. And yeah. New Year's are on. Oh, it's Wednesday. just a difficult time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all excited to get sort of back into work. And, and so and uh, when I get back from Africa, back into the gym, you know, all that good stuff. So it, it should be fun. So excellent. Yeah. Well, well, you know, for the show today, we should tell everybody what's coming up. We've got Hillary Moore Hebert. Um, to do our dressage today um, segment for the for the month. After this commercial, we're going to talk with Hilary Moore Hebert, senior editor from Dressage Today, about what's in the magazine this month. The Global Dressage Forum North America, the ultimate educational experience where champions meet. 
After this winter, who won't want to be in Wellington, Florida for the second annual Global Dressage Forum North America, presented by DressageClinic.com. Mark your calendars and book your plane tickets for the event of the season, Saturday, February 15th and Sunday, February 16th at the Jim Brandon Center. Some of the world's most recognized dressage experts and educators, including Stefan Clark, international rider Jan Brink, Conrad Schumacher, Christoph Hess, and many, many more will be presenting onstage demonstrations, lectures, interactive discussions, and panels consisting of some of the world's most internationally recognized trainers and judges. Did we mention the shopping in the warm Florida sun in February? The Global Dressage Forum North America 2014 is presenting the highest profile educational gathering ever to be held in North America, encouraging every dressage rider from across the U.S. and Canada to come and participate in this gathering representing dressage education in its finest form. Buy your tickets now as seating is limited. Be sure to use the coupon code USDF, the number 4, DFNA. That's USDF, the number 4, DFNA, all caps for a big savings on your tickets. Visit the website today at globaldressageforumna.com or call them at 561-909-7621. That's 561-909-7621. Let them know you heard about it on the Dressage Radio Show. Well... I am so excited to welcome Hillary Moore Hebert, Senior Editor for Dressage Today, for her monthly segment. Hillary, thanks for coming on. We love it when you're here. Hi, guys. Happy New Year. Oh, Happy, Happy New, New Year. year. Very good. Well, we are looking forward to starting this year off right. What is in the magazine this month? Okay, so we have a bunch of things. And the first thing is it's not just Happy New Year but it's happy anniversary. We're celebrating our 20th year as Dressage today, so we're really excited. There's a lot of cool things, which um, besides the training stuff, I just want to let you guys know if you can pick up the hard copy, we did vintage covers, and you can only imagine what some of the high-performance riders used to look like. And um, kicking it off, we have a lot of things in the magazine including a DT Classic each month where we have training our, our best training articles from the past. And this month is Hilda Gurney. And um, what I think the best part about them, in addition to the fact that they have tons of information, is the photos are from the original articles. So you get to see people in all of their uh, dated outfits. And just that, I think, is one of my favorite things. But <laughs> Hilda Gurney did an article on ideal dressage confirmation, and she talks about how it's really important to pay attention to the way that the horse moves and works in all three gates, not just being attracted to a big flashy trot. You really have to say, is the horse's walk rhythm clean? Is the canter what you want? Because it's stuff that's really going to be difficult to fix and you can't just have one strong gait and carry the rest of the way. So I thought that was an interesting point, and I wanted to see your thoughts on that about, um, you know, lessons you might have learned over the years about what gait strengths and weaknesses seem to be the biggest problems for you or the things that surprised you, um, you know, as you worked with horses that you've had in training. Yeah, I love I love this tip when we were talking about it before the show, because I am living this tip right now (laughs) because my pre St. George mare, she's been a challenge with the collected trot since I got her two years ago. I've had her two years. When I first got her, I was like, Oh my gosh, this collected trot. It's just not great. She is actually a really good extended trot because she's a terrible collected trot and her canners. Okay. And her walks. Okay. I mean, all the other gates are, are, are fine. So we've talked a lot about gates and I thought, Oh my gosh, you know, what have I done? She doesn't have a really great trot. Um, the trot has improved and it continues to get better. But you know, when, when I was talking with Conrad Schumacher about it, he said, Hey Reese, relax. Some of your best Grand Prix horses are the horses that maybe don't have these huge elastic gates. And he said, really, at the end of the day, you want her to be a Grand Prix horse. She is showing a lot of talent for that. And he said, relax, you only have half past each direction. 
in a collected shot, really, in the Grand Prix. And I thought, hey, you're right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so so for me, I'm sort of living that, and I sort of had to calm down and think about it. And and there is some validity to that. So that's sort of what I'm working with right now. Um, Philip, what about you? Yeah, I mean, uh, somebody, uh, you know, a trainer told me at some point, and I, I can't remember exactly who it was, but they said, like, okay, you know, a really flashy trot is only great for um, – training level first level and then maybe a little bit of second level but once you're in third and above it's all about the canter baby you know a a horse without a good rhythm and a good jump in the canter has a a lot of trouble making flying changes has a lot of trouble doing pirouettes you know like and like you just said you know once you get up even you know further and further into even the fei levels we're talking about canter you know yeah and uh and, and that's you know a a really good point but you know from an amateur's perspective going out and evaluating horses or, or buying horses it's really easy to get stuck in in a horse that has a that has a nice trot but you know we're always told the trot's the easiest one to develop and make sure that the horses have you know uh, uh, without a good walk you got a lot of trouble because there aren't a lot of exercises to develop the walk it has to kind of be there in the horse and the rider in the training has to not screw it up right and the canter needs just needs a really good uphill quality from the start. It doesn't have to be super balanced when it's beginning, but it has to be uphill, and it has to have uh, you know good carriage and good rhythm. So, um, you know, people who have trained a lot of FEI horses, a lot of Grand Prix horses, don't really look a lot at the trot. They look at something that's called kind of collectability, which shows you know balance towards the hind leg and this sort of thing, but an uphill travel, but not these huge trots. And that's really difficult because from a breeder's perspective, they're breeding more and more, I see really fancy, fancy trots and uh, a little bit weaker canters without a lot of hind leg power and and uh, uphill you know canter carriage because fancy trot sells horses. So, um, you know, we have to really remember the basics and, and really think about, you know, where we're going with the horse and, and not to get stuck in a, you know, first level mentality that, that you have that, you know, or, or even young horse classes mentality where, you know, in the young horse classes, they're really showing some really expressive, huge trots, you know, and, uh, and it's not until the six year old class where you have to show a flying change that you really are seeing the development of, of canter and how the horse canters. So it's a good point and uh, a really, really nice article to, to go back to and, and to, to read. So it's good. What's, uh, what else is in the, in the January magazine there, Hillary? So the next tip that I have is from Suzanne Bondit, who does our clinic and critiques riders that submit their photos. Uh, and the thing that she talked about this month that I thought was really helpful is that we're often told to straighten up when we're riding. And it's very common when you want to be straighter in your upper body to do that and become stiff like a soldier, and you end up sort of working against yourself. And her tip is to, and we can all do this right now, I want you guys in your chairs to shrink your body as short as possible, rounding your back, even if you're looking straight, and see how much you can scrunch down. And then I want you guys to grow as tall as you can, stretching your upper body as high as you can, but keep your seat muscles relaxed. And then go to a middle position and just feel how your body is tall, your diaphragm is level, but your shoulders and arms have relaxed down. And her suggestion to go to these extremes really should help you relax and have a nice tall upper body without being you know, too tight and restrictive in your way of being. Really, I think everybody should stop and do that <laughs> because uh, that is something. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't know about Philip, but I'm sitting in my chair and I, we've been taping a while, so I'm sort of slouching and I'm sort of in, like not sitting properly. And then it's like, oh wait, first of all, that's not good for me. Um, but you can really feel it, and I can see. I mean, I don't sit at a desk all the time, but I could see how you know if you were sitting or in your car in your commute, how you could actually really work on that. So that's a really great tip just to kind of think about that and do it. And I did it and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I was really slouching. Um, So that's interesting. Thank you for reminding me to sit up tall in my chair. (laughs) (laughs) I love I love the tips that you can do off the horse because, you know, I think a lot of our listeners are not riding six horses a day. So 
um, things you can do at work, at home. I, you know, that's that's handy. I um, to this point, I I remember I remember learning this lesson is because I used to ride like super. I mean, I'm tall already, but like super tall and um and i had one i think it was neil it was one of my coaches anyways he said you want to be tall without hollowing your back to an extreme right because once the back is is so hollow it becomes very rigid and stiff right and the position you know in a photo might look quite good but it's not all that useful for riding the horse and if you're not if you're you know a little bit too tall and too tight and like you said like a soldier then um, you, you can't soften your back to move with the horse. And I remember learning that lesson. And I thought it was one of the you know one of the better ones that I've that I've learned and that I've tried to you know transfer to my students. So um, if I had this article to refer to you know back then, I would you know that would have been really helpful. That actually your back needs to have a small you know a little bit of quality of roundness to it to be able to move your hips. Otherwise, it's all kind of locked up and and stiff, and you're working against the horse. So. Uh, um, a great, yeah, a great point, a great tip, and a, a great article, it sounds like. I like how um, all of us are riding horses all day long, and still we're, like, excited about the idea that in our spare time, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we can still And everything like, helps, you know, everything helps. Yes. We have to work I so mean, hard. Yeah, think about it. Like, I don't sit at a desk. This is about the only time I try to avoid desk work at all times. So this is, like, the only time I sit, and I've been sitting here for two hours, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I think I've actually been slouching for two hours. So, you know, just to remember <laughs> that is really important. But, yes, we, we, Philip and I and Hillary, that's why we like you so much. We're total geeks, and we could talk about this all the time. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> I love it. Fleeceworks manufactures pure Australian merino sheepskin and merino wool saddle pads and accessories. Their pads produce a vital thermal balancing layer to pull excess moisture and heat away from the horse's back, allowing muscles to work at maximum capacity without overheating. Fleeceworks Australian merino wool is breathable and hydrophilic, able to hold and store 35% of its own weight in liquid. A longtime staple of the medical field, Australian merino fibers have no equal when it comes to delivering a temperature-controlled, pressure-absorbing layer. The Fleeceworks philosophy, minimum bulk, maximum performance, and they have a variety of anatomically correct pads incorporating technologies and designs that address the individual needs of every horse and rider. Ask for Fleeceworks saddle pads and accessories by name at your local tack and feed store or visit them online at fleeceworks.com. I love it. So on that note, what's our next tip? Okay, so Bonnie Bonello, a Canadian rider who was on the WAGI team in 2010, uh, is taking over our World Equestrian Game Solutions on the back page this month, and she has a great tip that I think is really important. I think we are very visual people, and... Um, I notice this a lot with my students where we see our horse in front of us. We sort of sometimes forget what's behind. So when our horse gets heavy on the forehand and in our hand, we imagine that we kind of have to yank back and lift their front end. And what Bonnie said is that what you need to think about is that it's like a horse leaning on a fence to get grass on the other side of his pasture that's greener and taller and that what you need to do is think about the fact that he's really kind of leaning forward, has weight on his forehand, and the correct way is not to pull harder because if you were to pull, when your horse is grazing on a trail ride, say, you know, you would just lean into it more. What you need to do is get him to back away from the fence and take more weight on his hind end. And I, I really like this because I think it's sort of out of sight, out of mind um, that we often – forget that it's really sort of the source of a lot of things is what's going on behind the saddle. So I liked her tip a lot for that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great tip. I love those solutions. They're so helpful. And every, you know, this is a quick thing you can turn. And I have a client that saves every single one of them and has them in our locker and she has them up and they're really a helpful thing to kind of get a visual. Even if you say, okay, that's what I'm going to work on today. So I, I really, those are really helpful things. I, I mean, I like this tip because it's really, it's hard to visualize when you're riding or to think about, um, you know, for people that haven't ridden a lot of dressages. But, you know, the real point is getting the hind legs 
more under the center of gravity and you can't pull the front legs back you can't you can't pull the hind legs more underneath the horse's body you have to really um push them under and i think you know riders that cross train and horses that cross train i mean jumping is exactly this point you you can't pull the horse up over the fence you've got to get the the front end up by getting the hind leg under you know the the more the hind leg comes under you know especially in canter for the jumpers then the more successful the horse can you know spring the front end off the ground and uh and so it's not the rider's job to lift the horse off of the ground. It's the horse's job to carry weight on the hind legs. And so, you know, you can uh, you can always be working with the contact. I think that's important. But um, you've got to push the horse all the time. You know, make more energy. Make more, make collection out of energy. Make it out of something, right? You can't make it out of um, forceful hands or strong arms or, you know, the horse has to do the work and carry itself. And and just uh you know be brave as a rider to to ride forward and to get a little more you know quickness and and these ideas of impulsion so this is a good tip we're always you know as trainers we're always looking for our riders to uh to activate the horses and and push them and and not let the horse kind of cruise around the cruise around the ring and have the have our have his rider hold him up and carry him around and and for the rider to be really tired at the end of a lesson is is not you know really the point it's the horse that has to work so i think uh, it's a really good tip and and don't you and guys think, think oh go ahead hillary oh i was just gonna say i thought the one time that this was best illustrated for me is when this was explained to me while someone was lunging a horse in side reins and they asked the horse to do a quick transition for two strides from trot to walk when the horse was heavy on the forehand and the horse came up, you know, his pole came higher, and he b- brought his weight behind. And they said, you know, notice the fact that obviously the side reins can't adjust their length, but here you fix the entire problem without doing anything with that connection to the pit. That's a really good visual. I've, and and yeah, I was kind of... That's, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really good one. I like that. I, I have a different one, and, and that is I always tell my students that... If you feel the horse in the mouth or there's something going on up front, it's more than likely a symptom of what's going on behind. So we as humans think, oh, gosh, we got to fix that problem. Well, it's probably not the root of the problem. The root of the problem is probably the hind leg. So think about that. Fix, don't fix the symptom. Fix the problem, and the symptom will fix itself. So that's something that I always talk about. It, it's just a, di- you know, a different way to think about it. Yeah, I mean the the contact is is what shows you the problem, but you you can't fix contact with contact, right? You can't fix a contact problem by being str- stronger or lighter or, or whatever. It's just it, the horse shows you what's going on. That's your communication tool, and uh, and like you said, just a symptom. So, um, yeah, all good points. This is uh, yeah a nice discussion on on something that everybody works on. It's not like once you learn. You know, once you learn how to get a horse with more impulsion, it's it's fixed and you can do it all the time. Every horse is a little bit different and needs a little different push or a little different, you know, uh, rhythm. And, you know, this is just, uh, this is the essence of dressage, I think, is kind of energy and self-carriage and, and shifting the weight to the hind leg. It's, it's a lifelong struggle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. So, Hillary, what's our last tip? Okay, so our last tip is a training tip, but it's a bit different. And, um, you know, it relates to one of the articles we decided to do in our January issue called Destination Wellington. And uh, we decided that it's, the time has come that we really need to think about Wellington, Florida being the epicenter of dressage in the United States. And Um, You know, what my training tip is, is we've given people a guide to go down there and check out the shows, continuing education. But as someone who goes down there every year myself to cover things for the magazine, if you want to get that edge in your learning, I cannot think of a better way to do that than by going down and just doing any dressage event or you know, going to farms or whatever, uh, for even if it's two days that you can trick your family into taking you on vacation there and going with you, or if you can get some of your barn friends to go together. Um, There's high-performance riders from all over the world coming. You can sit in on clinics. It's just 
uh, you know, an irreplaceable way to learn, and it's the best way to see the best of the best competing in their horses and riders, um, you know, from all over the world. So that's my last training tip is just the importance of, uh, you know, if you can't get down there, even watching videos of some of the competitions, um, because it's just such a good learning experience. And I wanted to hear from you guys what your experiences were about, you know, what Wellington has become and what it means to dressage in the United States. Yeah, I, I, you know, the first time I went down, it's, I hate to say it, it's been over a decade now. And, and to see it really change, and I probably have spent six seasons now down, and um, it, it truly is the epicenter. It is so exciting to be there. And it's true, it's almost overwhelming in the beginning on what is going on, you know, because there is literally something going on every day. You can go to a clinic, you can have a lesson yourself, you can, you know, even going to the vendors, you know, you, I love just going to each vendor and saying, okay, what's new this year? Because there's always new products that are there and new things that are going on. So saddles and boots. And so it is absolutely worth your time to go. So Philip and I are going for the Global Dressage Forum North America. We're really excited about that. And I just booked my ticket and I was like, okay, I'm going to take the last flight out that I can because I want to soak up every second because there's something, there's always something to do. And it truly is worth your time to go down. It's it's pretty friendly to go down there. It's it's pretty easy. It's a very small area that, and especially now with global, with all the horse shows, there's a horse show, a CDI almost every weekend, and every CDI you're gonna see somebody good in the Grand Prix. Um, and it truly is. You know, both Philip and I are not going this year, um, but I'm saving my pennies for next year so that I can really go and enjoy and and really be a part of it. Um, but it is it is absolutely worth your time to go down. I think it's it's so you come yeah. back if you're warm, you're stimulated, it's fun. <laughs> you had a good time. You see people you know. You see great horses work. You can see a clinic, and you come back and you're like, okay, I can do winter. Yeah, I mean it's just um, it's just become this huge thing. I think the biggest difficulty is trying to find you know if you only have um like me and reese this this year like you know one weekend to go or one week to go the, the biggest difficulty is is picking which what event weekend? to go to yeah i mean it's <laughs> yeah. just there's so much you want to see and um so many clinics and uh, usdf has this and that and there's shows and and so um i think any time you can carve out to get to get down there is uh is time well spent and and um you know i i uh, haven't been going as long as reese but um, you know, every year there just seems to be more talk and, and, oh, this new event we're adding and this new weekend. And now there's the Nations Cup that they've got going on that's really cool for different um, countries. And, and uh, you know, Re- Reese and I try and cover as much as possible, you know, results and, and stuff going on. And, and uh, it's just a really good time. And not just for the U.S., but really it's it's huge for Canadians. I mean, so many of our Grand Prix riders take horses down there you see so many canadians in all these cdi shows and uh it's become huge for um our riders getting qualifying scores whether it's for pan ams or weg it's really a a kind of a and and now you're more europeans are coming over it's become really an international experience and and all the horses are there and it's just it's everything you need is right right in one little spot so it's it's just so cool and don't you feel like uh, it's interesting what you're saying about the qualifiers because I would have to say that it's easy for people to say how expensive, but for the quality of riding that I see there, to me, it's like the cheap way to see Olympic level competition. You know, if you can't afford to go to Normandy or Hong Kong, you know, to see those people, it might not be all condensed, but you're talking about, I mean, with, um, the Masters some years, uh, you know, you've seen Stephen Peters there. Practically the whole team, you know, is going to be there competing from Canada, U.S. for it to be a leg year. Um, you know, there's going to be some awesome pairs. I just am really excited to see. Yeah, I mean, it is it is true. And you can go just on the afternoon. I mean, you can watch a clinic in the morning and see the Grand Prix in the afternoon. And it's really because everything is so close. 
if you really look around and, and ask, and I'm sure, you know, if your trainer's not going, they probably know a trainer that's going. And people are really, it's a little more relaxed. It, 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 it's relaxed in the sense of typically people don't have as many horses in Florida as they have up north. So a lot of clinics are open. You can go see them. Some are not. It just depends. You've got to kind of look around. But you can certainly go to the horse show, and you can watch even a training level class and see some top-level horses with top professionals doing those, you know, not just the CDIs. I mean, just the whole quality of the horse show is, is great. So it is, I mean, it, it is expensive because you have to travel and go, but it is by far worth the money if you want to go and, and do so. Well, Hillary, as always, Philip and I, this is our favorite segment of the month. Thank you so much for coming on. And how do our listeners get a hold of you? So the best thing to do, and actually if you want to learn more about going to visit Wellington or to learn more about some of the other things we're doing with our anniversary year, is check out dressagetoday.com. And you can also see our coverage of the Wellington season on our social media pages, so Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and Pinterest. So we look forward to hearing from you guys if you have questions and we're always happy to help if you need some insider information. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. Have you heard of a yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii? It's a type of probiotic that benefits your horse's digestive tract. Often referred to as S. boulardii, it works in several different ways. One unique property of S. boulardii is that it supports the stimulation of the enzymes found in the intestinal lining. These enzymes help your horse digest starches and sugars in the small intestine. When the sugars and starches are more completely digested, Fewer of them escape into the hindgut where they can ferment and cause imbalances that may lead to colic, diarrhea, and laminitis. Saccharomyces boulardii is found in Nalox Advanced, made by Kentucky Performance Products. Nalox Advanced contains a blend of yeast, fermentation solubles, and stomach buffers. These ingredients work together to maintain your horse's digestive tract in peak condition. Nalox Advanced is recommended for horses of all ages and stages and is fed on a daily basis. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. Well, Reese, we've got a listener email to get to this week, which is great because uh, it adds content to our show and and, uh, you know, lets us know what, what our listeners are thinking about and what they'd like to hear about. So uh, um, let's get to that. I'll try and Great. kind of paraphrase it as best I can. Um, okay. Sometimes we get really long emails and I just want to get to the uh, get to the point of it here. Um, this is a listener, Ashley, and she wrote to us. I'm not sure if this topic has been covered yet, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on modern versus classical dressage. It seems like in every sport there are those who are discontent with the progression and direction of a sport is taking, and this can certainly be a hot topic. What are your thoughts on the direction dressage is taking the show ring versus classical principles, uh, especially regarding the flashy big movement, that's in quotations, you see most notably in extended trots versus more classically correct style. Also, in a related topic to this, what are your thoughts on the new FEI scoring test changes and how do you think this will influence the focus in the upper levels? As always, thanks for sharing your insight. So, Reese, let's, this is kind of a two-parter. So, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, well, well, you can yeah, take absolutely. it away here. So, absolutely. So, the, the second part is a great question. In a related topic, what are your thoughts on the new FEI scoring and tests? And we, Philip and I talked about this before the show, and we are going to have, we're going to do a, a, a whole segment on that. So stay tuned for yeah. the next so, so show. So kind of some bigger t- changes, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, well, in introducing new tests and figuring out how that affects the old tests. I mean, there was, some, there was some discussion about taking the I2 out of the FEI system or something. So there's all right. kinds to do with this. I think it's a huge topic. Yes. Um, we're going to maybe hope, hopefully have a FEI judge or somebody mm-hmm. more closely um 
knowledgeable about about the yeah. the new fei stuff so so we'll take care of that one yeah. next week hang in there that's a big hang one we're, we're gonna get to <laughs> it yeah so the classical versus modern i mean i think this is always a great question and i think that at the end of the day um and and i know philip and i talk a lot about this because we're totally geeky and talk a lot about dressage theory and that kind of stuff um with with ourselves but also with our friends that are trainers and you know it, it, I think that it, it it's a huge topic and yeah and there's a lot of discussion yeah. to do with this so we're going to try and do our best to kind of sum up some points that 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 we think about in this area and then um you know hopefully not irritate anybody or or create a big yeah email thing I don't want my email full of you know oh, well you said this or this I mean it, it's just a huge thing and there's a lot of discussion points mm-hmm. and you know it can go back and forth for forever Right. And I think, you know, we were talking a little bit before the show and I think you made a great point and that is you kind of have to pick a style. And I think that that's right. I mean, I think that there's a lot of discussion that some people are sort of neoclassical and um, but you really have to pick a system, how whatever that is, if that's a French system, if that's a German system, and you kind of have to stick with that system in a way. Wouldn't yeah, you agree? Well, I mean, my, my point was just this, that that um, there is a there is a large range within the classical systems, mm-hmm. and there's a large range of different training within a more modern or you know I like to use a competition system rather than yeah. kind of modern. But you know it's very hard to pigeonhole your training into one or the other. I think there's I think those are just <laughs> two very it's very too much of a narrow way to to think about training because. Um, you know, I've I've experienced a lot of different trainers, and I try and educate myself as much as possible. And there are lots of classical training principles, um, you know, and within maybe what I would describe as more of a German competition system, right? Or right, you know. And I think as many trainers as there are, there's as many systems that there are. Mm-hmm. So, I think this classical versus modern thing gets a little bit heated because, you know, there's there's a, there's a it's just a huge range. You can't describe. Right you know, three different systems of training as being modern. This is, this is classical. This is, you know, this is only classical and this is only modern. And it's just, right. So that's where a lot of the issues come in. I think, you know, what I, what I try and do is, is train mostly in, in a classical way and, and adding different tools to that. I think, you know, as many horses as there are, there are training styles. I think there only comes into, you can only pigeonhole training into, I think, good and bad. Right. Whereas any system that uses force or makes unhappy horses or, you know, um, or un- unhappy, unhealthy, unsound horses, that's a bad system. Right. Whether it's modern or classical, I don't care. It's not in the good well-being of the horse. And, any, right. and in any system in which you're trying to achieve harmony, happy, athletic horses, that's a good system. Right. You no, know, I, whether I, you're I, showing I, or not. A lot of people like to compete and a lot of people don't. So Right. Yeah. No, I think that that's that's exactly the way you have to look at it. And and at the end of the day, we do. We want happy, healthy horses that people enjoy to ride. Yeah, and that are, you know, that are obedient and not being mm-hmm. forced. You know, any system Absolutely. that uses force is is not a good one, whether you label it classical or not. Right. Um, you know, but I think we all, you know, any good system has the end goal of of having an obedient you know, a horse with a good way of going that that develops the horse horse in an athletic way, develops the communication between rider and horse. You know, those are all good. I think just the competition system. You know, the FEI and the national federations have. You know, they they've put together criteria. Um, you know, they they've developed education through judging and training trainers. And you know, I think I think it's not a per, you know com- competing is not a perfect system, but it's getting better you know i think there's, sure. you know sure. it has it has its flaws in that um you know you know there's subjective scoring and whenever you have subjective scoring it, it, it's not a clear picture versus you know black versus white this is good this is bad and then you right. get all that gray area because you have to give a horse and rider a score every horse and rider is different you know so you, you're trying to judge you know uh, um, a 15 hand horse versus a 17 hand horse and and I think there has to be a lot of appreciation for just how hard it is for a judge to sit there yeah. and, oh. and judge. 
Oh my gosh, it is so <laughs> hard. And and those guys have a ton of education. I mean, it, judging is, you know, it's very easy to criticize the judge. It is not as easy to sit in that box and do that all day long and try, you know, it's a little bit easier if you're teaching. You know, you only teach, let's say, 10 people max and you can get up and you can have a coffee whenever you want, yep. essentially. You know, those guys are stuck there. They have to go. They have to eat when they're told. They have to go to the bathroom when they're told. And <laughs> and it's hot. Sometimes they're sitting or it's cold. And, you know, that is not – and that, that's just – and then they see – like, can you imagine judging 45 training level rides? Like, whoa. That's it's so hard. Hard. It's a hard it's thing. And so I, and I don't, hard. Right. And, and that <laughs> does play into classical versus modern. And then you have owners and riders that are riding and get paid and make their livelihood. So it's not as, as cut and dry. It's, yeah, it's just very it's, hard to be cut and dry. And, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, and the other thing, too, is a, is a judge is bringing to, uh, to the ring their, their own life experience. Sure. And remember yeah. that a judge is only judging what they see at that moment. They're not judging your training style. They're not judging you know, yesterday's ride that went so well and today's that didn't go so well. So it's important as a rider, especially an, uh, an amateur rider, to not think that their judgment is a personal reflection on your riding or necessarily whether they love your horse or don't love your horse. You know, the, you got to try and take a little bit of the personal feelings about your ride out of it and the judge is just trying to be as objective as they can on that day watching you and your horse. Right. You know? That's exactly right. And and that is that is how we compete. And that is our system in North America. And, you know, classical and, and it is different when you have to do something at a certain period of time yeah. versus a classical saying, system. You can do things at, at your own pace in a way. There's yeah, no at, at, it kind of it's uh, it's training more at your leisure. Right. I mean, I have to say that the riders that I have that are are uh, thinking of competing there's a lot more pressure on the rider oh, yeah. and the horse Absolutely. and the horse okay. so there there's all sorts of issues that have to do with that and you know riders that that have big goals to get their horse to the next level and and i don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that with the right guidance but it, it just is a different way of training i think more in in the classical systems there is more time, you know, towards training and taking your time with it and not necessarily having deadlines like, okay, I have to write a third level test one by such and such a date. And that's, and, and, and that's really, uh, it can be more beneficial for the horse and the rider. It can take the pressure off in a lot of ways. But I think both ways are fine. Both ways are right. fine as long oh, as, yeah. as, long as, as long there's not, as... you know, as long as, again, you're trying to make a happy, healthy, yeah. sound um, athlete. Right, exactly. And that's, I think that's really, and it boils down to it. And are you having fun? Yeah. <laughs> I think you have to remember that, you know, are you having a good time? Is your horse having a good time? Do you enjoy going to ride your horse? Do you enjoy learning about the sport? I mean, dressage is heavily theory based. Do you enjoy yeah. reading about what's happening? And I think that there's, a, you, you need to be able to mix both. That's my personal opinion is that you should be able to mix both. You should do the yeah. classical theory. And then, you know, we, we as competition trainers, I mean, we, go show that's what we do yeah. and um so you know i think it's it's a great debate and it, it will continue from now on I, it's it'll not, continue forever it will uh, yeah continue and, forever and and i think that that again you have to look at it sort of subjectively what are your goals is your horse having a good time and and in a way pick you know say like this time of year for us is really training i mean we're yeah. this is we are not showing so we can we can take time and, and and i try to do that over periods of time of the year you know winter and summer are good times for us to say hey come on let's step back let's train we we show heavily spring fall um you know right now is is hey what how what do we need to do to get to the next level yeah so we kind of revert back to yeah well, i mean we can go classical. back to more more of the you know more i don't know classical or just training yeah. part of the riding you know and not necessarily the showing and right. and uh you know i think getting to the next part of the question what do you think about you know um big moving horses and how the sport is going i think you know, just because the horse is big moving doesn't mean it's not trained classically. Uh, right. You know, again, try not to think of any of these things, classical, modern, and black and white ideas. It's just um, the breeding has changed in the horses. I mean, if you think about um, classical riding at uh, at the Spanish Riding School in Austria, they are dealing with one type of horse, the lipids on her. Right. They train right. the lipids on her. Right. 
as competition trainers, we have to train every kind of horse. Everything. Thoroughbreds, warm bloods, uh, yeah. lipids on as well. I, I rode yeah. a, a, we bred a half lipids on her. I mean, the, you know, so I think our, our system or the training, I think, has to be a little bit more flexible to incorporate Percherons, they incorporate heavy horses, light horses, ponies, everything. So, um, you know, I think of, of the systems being developed for the horses that are being bred. Right. You know, so the you know the system has to change. Uh, you know, lipids have their own confirmation and their own um, faults and and pluses, and and a big, huge, warm blood with an enormous extended trot has to be ridden. You know, with classical ideas, but. You might have to tweak it a little bit. And I think going out of the box sometimes to train a horse. And, and, you know, I think that's all fine. I think if any system gets a little bit too rigid, I think it can create unhappy horses. I mean, and that's my personal agree. opinion. So No, I agree. Um, I, th- I think you're absolutely You know, right. and showing only gives us a guideline on, on to which how we should work the horse or, you know, gets, gets right. us in front of a judge who is is trained to give feedback and to give you ideas about some stuff that you want to improve, you know, or, sure. you know, you t- and remember that not many horses are scoring tens in the ring. So the judge has to be critical of what they're looking at and say, this is a little bit better. This is a seven versus a five or a six because of, you know, something that the judge sees that they like a little bit more or a little bit less. I, you know, it, I think it's. It's it's just a really hard job to do. I mean, and and so I don't think you know even in the Grand Prix and the World Stage they're breaking records, but you know the best ride is in a technical test is still, I believe, eighty five. Right? Is that the world right. record in the I in the Grand so. Prix? So that's nowhere near one hundred percent. They're not saying, oh, that's the perfect horse and everybody should ride towards that. Like they're not saying Vallegro is perfect. They're saying, you know, there this is a little bit better than the next horse that comes in. And, and there's lots of horses scoring over 80% nowadays. And I think more so than we've seen in the past, they're happier. They're more yes. relaxed. We're seeing really yes. horses with really big movement and really good horses that are now showing, you know, increased relaxation. And I'm saying that's, that's good training. That's getting better. And that's more of what we want to see. You know, I think it, it's just hard because also with all the new technology, everybody can hop on the internet and watch the this, the test as it's happening and be critical. I think right. you know huh. our job is to say you know what's what's going good and and how do we improve on the little things that need to be better. And uh, I think every trainer is trying to do that, whether you're riding in a competition or you're not. So again, it's a big topic. Yeah. I think there's a good lot job, of discussion Bella. that yeah. can happen. Agree. I, no, um, I think that was great. Yeah, you so know, keep so, the listeners. Yeah, keep your listener questions coming. Yeah, we coming. we love having some topics to talk about, and we look forward to the FEI discussion. That's going to be a great discussion. We will make sure we have somebody next week um, to talk about that and and kind of give everybody an update. And and plus, I I need the update too. I am not as as schooled on that right now. So we'll we'll we will do that, and we look forward to that next time. You can find our show notes and links to today's guests on the website dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com, and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. You can find me at philipparksequestrian.com, and my email is philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week for allowing us to put on a great show. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we'll talk to you next week.